I'm here today to uh, introduce uh, Kelly Roberts, um, who uh, has uh, also served uh, with me on the, the board of directors of the um, Georgia ACI ch chapter. And, and Kelly is an uh, engineer here uh, locally in Atlanta. But uh, Kelly Roberts um, uh, is a principal and project manager at Walter P. Moore uh, with structural design experience ranging from educational and healthcare facilities to high rise office towers. Uh, she leads WPM Sustainable Design Community of Practice for Structures Group, specializing in whole building life cycle assessment and the use of sustain sustainable and salvaged materials. She is a founding board member of the nonprofit Material Reuse Center, the Life Cycle Building Center of uh, Greater Atlanta, where she currently serves as a, an advisory board member. Kelly is a market leadership advisory board member of USGBC Georgia and currently serves on the USGBC Materials and Resource uh, Technical Advisory Group. She is a co-chair for the Atlanta Carbon Leadership Forum, uh, HUB, uh, the immediate past president of uh, ACI Georgia and a steering committee member for AIA Atlanta, uh, COTE and a member of the ACI 318 Sustainability Committee. She is also a founding chair of the NCSEA um, Sustainability Committee and an advi advisory council member of the SEI St Sustainability Committee Committee's SE 2050 Task Force. Kelly was named one of the 100 most influential, influential women by Engineering Georgia Magazine and is a 2017 Design Futures Council Emerging Leader and an ENR Magazine Top Young Professional. And uh, Kelly is going to be speaking to us today about embodied carbon and the concrete industry, and she's going to let us know what we need to know. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Kelly. Thank you so much, Rick, and um, thank you everyone who's able to join us today. So as Rick mentioned, um, I'm a structural engineering project manager um, and principal at Walter Moon Moore uh, here in Atlanta. And I'll be speaking about embodied carbon and the concrete industry today. Um, I'll be able to take some questions at the end. So um, save those. I think that there is a um, Q&A box that you can enter um, those questions into. And then I'll address them from there um, at the end of the presentation. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, first, I'd like to just give you a brief introduction to Walter P. Moore in case you're not in case you're not familiar with who we are. We're founded in 1931 in Houston, Texas, and now have over 20 offices across the country um, and internationally with over 700 staff. Uh, we're a multidiscipline engineering firm with focus on structural engineering, and we do a wide variety of projects from stadiums and ballparks to large commercial buildings and major hospitals. Um, to small renovations and retrofits and just everything in between. Um, our primary market and my expertise is in building construction. So um, I'll preface that this talk is definitely focused, focused on buildings, buildings and building concrete um, and carbon and not really infrastructure, transportation or industrial uses um, of concrete, just, just so you know that. Um, so with that, uh, let's dive in uh, with a brief introduction to embodied carbon to ensure that we're all speaking the same language. Uh, embodied carbon is just one of one piece of the puzzle of the carbon puzzle, and it's associated with uh, building construction and use. So embodied carbon has to do with all the materials and products used to construct the building. It's all of the carbon dioxide emitted by extracting, manufacturing, transporting, and installing building materials. And it's not a small amount of carbon. Every year, uh, 66 billion square feet of buildings are constructed. And the embodied carbon emissions of that construction is approximately 3.8 billion metric tons of CO2 per year. In fact, we're building so much that we're actually building a new New York City every month for the next 30 years. Between now and 2050, we're going to add 2 billion people to the planet and close to double the square footage of the built environment. And of course, we know that if we carry on with business as usual, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, predicts that we will well overshoot the goal of staying below two degrees Celsius warming. So looking at this a different way, uh, these graphs are from Architecture 2030. 
We know that buildings alone account for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. 28% is from operational, um, which, you know, prior to the last decade, um, that is where the uh, focus has been, and rightly so, because it's a bigger piece of the pie. But we've also driven down operational emissions through smarter designs, and there's been a big shift to focus on that 11% of embodied carbon. Because the critical thing about embodied carbon is that it happens day one, when the building opens and it never gets reduced, it's always there. No future efficiency will ever drive it down. And in the next 30 years, the critical time period, according to the IPCC, embodied carbon will account for half of new construction carbon. And as we approach 2050 and try to decarbonize the building industry, we can't get there without focusing on this piece of the pie. Of course, there's been a groundswell of discussion and advocacy around embodied carbon in the last couple of years. In 2019, the World Green Building Council released the Embodied Carbon Call to Action Report. This is the first call to action that really started to name all the stakeholders involved in embodied carbon and task them with what they can and should do about it and, and produce deadlines. AIA, of course, has addressed embodied carbon. In 2019, uh, they issued a climate emergency and added language to the code of ethics surrounding sustainability and the use of healthy and environmentally friendly materials. AIA Committee on the Environment, AIA Code, added a whole building life cycle analysis as part of the best practice to their toolkit for projects seeking the AIA top 10 status. And then just this year, AIA 2030 added embodied carbon as one of the metrics that can be reported um, for projects in DDX, their, uh, their database. And of course, as I mentioned previously, Architecture 2030 has been leading the way on embodied carbon as well, issuing a 2030 challenge for embodied carbon to be carbon neutral by 2050. Another organization that's a true leader in this space is the Carbon Leadership Forum. This is a group that's solely focused on embodied carbon and have been doing some incredible work in this space. If you're interested in learning more about them, I really encourage you to check out their website. There's a wealth of information on CLF's website. There are also local hubs in cities across the United States, and you can find out if there's one in your city by going to the website. Uh, we have one here in Atlanta um, that I co-chair along with Amanda Atkinson from Holder Construction, and we'd love to have you be a part of it. And in response to the growing importance of embodied carbon and to complement organizations such as AIA 2030, an initiative called SE 2050 was created within the Carbon Leadership Forum and then adopted by SEI. Uh, the Structural Engineering Institute. Uh, SC 2050 is a challenge for structural engineers to push for carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. By 2050. Um, SC 2050 is essentially our opportunity as structural engineers to own our carbon and do something about it. You can go to SC 2050's website to look to see who are the signatories. And, you know, as architects, I strongly advise you to hire structural engineers that have signed on to this and then challenge them to meet their carbon goals that they've committed to. So let's get into some data about uh, embodied carbon. So the breakdown of embodied carbon can vary somewhat wildly from project to project, obviously based on the specifics of this project and size and materials, but we do know a couple, a couple things. We know that most of the emissions are from structure, which is why I'm speaking to you today as a structural engineer. Most are from steel and concrete, and most of the impact from concrete is from the cement. And of course, cement is not the same thing as concrete. Cement is part of concrete. It makes up only 12% of the weight of a concrete mix, but it's responsible for 95% of the carbon emissions. It's the second most consumed resource in the world after water, with more than 4 billion tons produced globally every year and accounts for 5 to 8% of total global CO2 emissions. But of course, cement is not concrete. It's a constituent of concrete, as I mentioned. But we're not going to stop designing with concrete. Uh, it's one of the most versatile building materials on the planet. And one of the greatest aspects of its versatility is that the recipe can be changed. It can be adapted. And we can experiment with new ad admixtures, ingredients, proportions, and technologies. The combinations and possibilities for concrete are pretty much endless. 
and our ability to reduce its impact is also, it's also somewhat endless. It has a lot of potential. And so that's why it's really critical that um, architects, structural engineers, and concrete industry professionals uh, really lead this embodied carbon co conversation. Uh, the materials that we specify um, and produce are extremely impactful to the environment and to overall carbon emissions, and we need to be involved in reducing their impact. Now, of course, there's no doubt that the concrete industry has been a lightning rod for criticism over its car carbon emissions because of its high impact. But recognizing this impact and responding to changing trends in construction, many concrete technologies have evolved and emerged in recent years uh, to tackle carbon reductions in concrete products. And the industry, um, industry groups have responded with guides, industry-wide EPDs, and regional benchmarks in an effort to um, increase the amount of information available and increase concrete material transparency. One of the advantages of concrete as a material is that there's a lot of potential for innovation, as I mentioned. And I'm sure many of you have heard of some of these new technologies, even as with the mainstream media even reporting on them. And we'll discuss these a bit more later and, and many more um, technologies. And this just makes me chuckle. Um, if you're looking for more introductory information on concrete and body carbon, just search YouTube. Um, and you'll find these Girl Scouts. The topic of embodied carbon uh, solutions for concrete has gotten so mainstream that even the Girl Scouts are talking about it. And these girls are right on the money with their understanding of the challenges and solutions um, related to uh, embodied carbon and concrete. So there's clearly a lot of discussion um, in the industry about embodied carbon and concrete. Um, but what's being done about it on real projects? Where can we start? There are of course a lot of anecdotal ways to reduce embodied carbon on a project. And we'll discuss some of those strategies, but the real way to know where you stand, the way to weigh different options um, with actual carbon values and numbers is to perform a whole building life cycle assessment. This is the process through which a baseline building can be established and then strategies to reduce carbon can be implemented um, and measured. In general, a life cycle assessment is an evaluation of the environmental effects associated with any given activity from the initial gathering of raw material from the earth until the point at which all residuals are returned to the earth. It's an ISO governed process where we look at all the phases in the life of a material from the harvesting of the material through manufacturing and construction to demolition and disposal. And then we look at multiple environmental impact categories, including greenhouse gases or global warming potential, as well as whichever others we want to be looking at that may be regionally specific. LCA is an essential component to getting to a whole building LCA. The process starts with the PCR or the product category rules. These are the guidelines that essentially establish the rules for performing a product LCA. Um, there is, for example, a concrete PCR. The result of a product LCA is an EPD, an environmental product declaration. A whole building LCA is essentially an entire system of products, each with their own impacts all tallied up to comprise an entire building. This is an example of an EPD for a specific product. It reads like a nutrition label for the environmental impacts of a product, in this case for a concrete mix. Our goal for a whole building LCA is to start with a baseline building and improve upon it. And unfortunately, the world of uh, whole building life cycle assessment isn't as cut and dry as operational energy where you have ASHRAE 90.1 as a baseline. But there is a guide that was written by SEI Sustainability Committee that defines some guidelines for establishing the baseline for this. The guide built upon previous work by Athena, ASTM, Kate Simonen, um, and Carbon Leadership Forum and past SEI sustainability publications. For concrete, for example, this guide says that you need to use the NRMCA uh, regional industry benchmarks as a baseline for concrete mixes. 
And it's important to note that these are not just straight cement mixes. So thinking that you can just specify 10 or 20% cement replacement um, all over a project, is it's not going to cut it. In order to uh, achieve the reductions, you have to be surgical and focus on every element individually and focus on putting the carbon where we actually need it. Um, and we'll go into this a little bit later. So first we establish a baseline structure and for the whole building LCA, we look at the entire structure and all of the enclosure. And then from there, you can also consider other elements such as interior elements. In order to actually perform the LCA or, um, or an embodied carbon analysis, you have to start with the quantities. If you're regularly tracking materials in Revit, it's made much easier. You can start with a bill of materials that you likely got from a BIM model, and then you input that into a commercial LCA software. And there are a number of them, such as Tally, OneClick, um, or Athena. Um, and then the environmental impact factors are baked into the software, and then they're curated in such a way that they can be used together. And from this, you can get comparative output that then you can use to determine where your greatest impacts or hotspots are. From there, you can take a number of steps, steps to reduce your impact. And what's great about this is that you can actually achieve lead points now for attempting an LCA on your projects. And then you can even get more points for showing that you, you've reduced your impact. So we're doing this on a lot of projects that are you know, pursuing lead certification or that have sustainability goals. Um, we are performing whole building life cycle assessments on projects and um, specifying the results of those, of those analyses um, on our drawings. So to tackle embodied carbon on our projects, the carbon emissions from concrete must be consider considered basically every time as it can be found on every single project. Even if it's, you know, theoretically a steel, what you may call a steel building, there's still concrete and it still has an impact. Um, and to make a meaningful impact, most projects are going to need to take a multifaceted approach by incorporating strategies like cement reduction, cement replacement, and a variety of other new technologies. As concrete designers and producers and specifiers, we have to be nimble and willing to think outside the box and then consider new technologies as they arise. So let's look into some strategies here to reduce the carbon in concrete. The first are likely um, pretty obvious, but they can't be forgotten. It's always critical to optimize concrete volume through good design. And there are a host of strategies um, that you can take to do that. A lot involved, you know, structural analysis and uh, structural engineering technologies, but um, I won't get into all of that here. But it's always important to remember that you need to be reducing concrete volume where you can. Um, that's, you know, just basically the first step or optimizing concrete volume, I should say, rather than reducing, but optimizing it. Um, it can also be helpful to limit the amount of finishes in the building by using the structure as finish. I know that this is a strategy that's taken, I think, much more often nowadays um, on, on projects, um, which is exciting, I think, to see. Um, of course, there's um, new form liners and board form uh, concrete is available. Um, I know that there was a session that's in this conference that talked about um, new form liners that can be used. And so really taking advantage of all the new technologies that exist in that realm to use structure as finish is, is a helpful part of um, reducing embodied carbon by limiting the amount of finishes. And then the other strategies that we'll get into a little more detail here are optimizing cement usage. That's obviously very critical. Um, writing performance specifications versus attribute-based specifications. Um, you know, it's no longer really acceptable to just have somewhere in your spec that you need 20% fly ash um, in your concrete. That's not going to cut it, and that's not really useful for concrete mix designers to be able to create sustainable mix designs for a project. It has to go beyond beyond that. We are way past just saying 20% fly ash. 
Um, and in order to do that, you need to create an element-based specification. So I'll talk about what that really means. And in doing that, you can use strategies such as longer cure times um, and cement alternatives to achieve uh, reductions in carbon. It's also important to specify max GWP and discuss the carbon goals for your project. Um, how far is, a, is an owner willing to go on your project? What are the carbon goals for the project? And then requesting EPDs. EPDs are really no, how we know what we're really getting with every single concrete mix. Um, there are a host of ways to get around requesting EPDs, um, but it's really the gold standard of understanding exactly what products and what their carbon impact is in, in, in our building. Um, and then of course we can look at opportunities to sequester carbon in the building. So the next steps after um, optimizing concrete volume and using structures finish um, is to um, optimize Portland cement usage so, because it is of course very carbon intensive. Um, for example, considering the amount of time needed uh, for concrete to reach maximum strength or to cure in regard to elements such as foundations, columns and shear walls can lead to mixed designs with less Portland cement. Uh, typically for a multi-story building like the one I'm showing here, foundations may be specified to reach strength at 56 or 90 days instead of the usual 28. Uh, columns and shear walls may be allowed to also have longer cure times, potentially 56 days. And what this results in is that higher strengths may not necessarily mean higher carbon if the day at which the strength can be lengthened. So if you're looking at this graph here, you can see that the percent reduction of uh, cement for uh, columns and foundations and then the shear walls, for example, is very high. You can see that kind of dark teal color. And that's because their strength gain was delayed. So they were able to use supplementary cementitious materials such as fly ash and slag, which sometimes can delay strength gain, but can replace cement and ultimately lead to higher strengths, but just not right away. Um, in this case, there were some post-tension floors and so more cement was needed at an earlier age. And so um, if you can imagine that you have a cement budget and you think of where you need it the most and what elements can have higher cement replacements or alternatives, the LCA can be used to understand how best to optimize cement um, for different elements. Um, so if you take a data centric element based approach, it can lead to much more carbon efficient designs. Um, and then addi additionally, um, looking at cement um, reduction, uh, cement may be reduced in some regions by specifying higher quality aggregate or using less water. Um, for example, I know on the West Coast um, in some California regions, um, it's the aggregate that really limits the, uh, the strength of the concrete mix. And they have been in some cases shipping down aggregate, I think from the Pacific Northwest or British Columbia, um, in order to uh, increase the strength of those concrete mixes and thereby reduce the cement. And the uh, carbon emitted by the transportation process is actually less than the uh, carbon that it would have taken to increase the strength by adding cement to the mix. Um, so clearly um, optimizing Portland cement usage is a, an important strategy in reducing the carbon impact of concrete mix design. So um, obviously in general, mix optimization is key and engineers should ensure that their specifications allow mix design, concrete mix designers, um, the ability to minimize carbon impact by only specifying the performance requirements necessary for each structural element. Concrete specifications should be written to state what strength is needed for each element type. Um, in, at Walter B. Moore, we do this by providing a concrete matrix on our drawings. This, uh, the required performance based parameters for each element are specified here by that element. And that will essentially translate into a mixed design for that element. Um, what's critical here is 
that only what's needed is specified. Um, for example, it's not always necessary to limit this water to cement ratio. Um, when limiting the water to cement ratio unnecessarily, it can increase the cement and carbon footprint. So it's really important that you only put exactly what you need here and exactly what is required um, by code um, and not more than that. We wanna allow mixed designers um, the ability to optimize the mixed designs and make them as environmentally friendly as possible while remaining cost conscious. Um, if we give them that flexibility, um, it will be in a much better position um, as a project team. So the next strategy um, are supplementary cementitious materials and cement alternatives. Uh, Project Drawdown, which is a comprehensive plan to reduce global warming, identified and it comes up and it has tons of different strategies. Um, but what's interesting is that they identified using cement alternatives, I mean, concrete rose to their radar and using cement alternatives as strategy number thir 36 um, to reduce global warming. It had estimated a potential carbon savings of 440 million tons of carbon dioxide annually if the strategy were implemented. Um, several well-known cement alternatives such as fly ash and, sla and, and slag um, have been successfully used for decades and are common in modern mixed designs. And in the short term, while other cement alternatives are being researched and introduced to the market, um, maximizing the industry's use of these readily available cement alternatives um, is one of the most important steps designers can take to reduce concrete's carbon impact. And while it may be obvious to um, most of us, um, it's not always maximized on every project. And in some cases, it's limited unnecessarily by specifications. Um, you may find in specifications still that no more than 20% fly ash may be used on a project. Uh, that may not be appropriate. And as mentioned, it needs to be element-based and it needs to be project specific. And we need to stop putting things in our specifications um, that may not need to be there. There are several supplementary cementitious materials, cement alternatives, and then cement blends that are being researched now and are available commercially in some markets that designers can start to use in their mixed designs. Uh, Metakaolin is a pozzolan produced from the calcination of kaolin clay at much lower temperatures um, than Portland cement and therefore results in a lower carbon impact. Uh, However, metakaolin has typically been expensive and has typically been used to replace only up to 10% of cement and thus has not been widely used. Of course, there's tons of ongoing research um, on metakaolin and, and its potential use, and I'm, I'm sure that that will um, continue. Um, it's also useful in mitigating ASR, um, and it's therefore used commercially in some areas, and we have seen it in the market. And so it's just something that we need to look for and look for its future possibility um, in our mixes. Uh, limestone calcined clay, or LC3, is a ternary blended cement comprised of Portland cement with calcined clay and limestone. Um, and I think preliminary studies show that LC3 is very promising to achieve lower CO2 emissions um, and potentially have lower prices in the construction market. And there's also recycled glass and volcanic ash pozzolans that have been used in concrete mixtures. Um, I know it's used in several mixtures in the southeastern U.S. Um, because there's a manufacturer manufacturer located in Tennessee. So this is, I think, another technology that we're looking for um, to see be used in commercial applications. Um, for all of these, I know that there are sessions in this conference that focus on all of these different SEMs. Um, so if you didn't catch those, I think there are recordings available and you can go back and look at them later. Um, but these are definitely things that are being discussed, you know, at this conference and are being discussed widely um, in the market. And so look for these technologies and be open to potentially using them. Um, and then this is not a cement alternative, um, but the concrete industry is also seeing a surge 
in the specification in use of type 1L cement. Uh, type 1L cement meets ASTM C595. And it's essentially a, a blend of cement and then naturally occurring limestone. And due to that natural limestone, uh, type 1L cements have a lower embodied carbon and, than typical cements, but have very similar performance characteristics. Uh, so it's very promising. And typical limestone component makeups for type 1L um, are usually in the rain range of 10 to 15%. So you do see a reduction in carbon there. Um, so the important takeaway here, I think, is that these new technologies do exist and you should remain open to using them. And if you're interested in learning more, there's a lot of resources out there on these. Another emerging technology um, in concrete pr production is to utilize carbon sequestration and injection. Uh, technologies such as carbon cure, carbocrete, Blue Planet and Solidia um, have been emerge, emerging in different markets around the country and have different um, uses and applications. Um, nationally, we have used Carbon Cure on a variety of project types and applications. Um, for a commercial office building project here in Atlanta, our team was able to work with the supplier for the drilled pier foundations to inject CO2 into the concrete at the batch plant and reduce the cement contact content for those elements by 7% for that application. Um, so I think this technology and technology similar to it, um, when used really in combination with other uh, cement alternatives and um, other strategies, uh, they can help project teams achieve embodied carbon reduction goals on, on their project. Um, and of course, I, I'm sure that more technologies will be coming. Um, and so we just need to remain open to them. Um, and while availability and acceptance will be barriers to any technology, uh, consistent requests from specifiers for new materials may hasten uh, their availability in research. Um, you know, one thing that I've done in, in my concrete specifications is that I have, I have mentioned things like carbon mineralization without specifying any specific producer but saying that carbon mineralization um, shall be considered for use on this project. So, um, you know, putting stuff like that in your specifications, just opening the door to being accepting of new technologies or being interested, bringing those types of things up in a pre-con meeting, asking the question, um, you know, if you're in a concrete pre-con meeting and the supplier is there asking the question, you know, how are they addressing um, embodied carbon at their batch plants? Um, what technologies are they using? What can they bring to the table? Opening that dialogue um, is, is really important. Um, if we all just get to a point where we're all communicating effectively as project teams, bringing mixed designers to the table, uh, potentially partnering with concrete mix suppliers early in a project, talking to them about what's coming, what's available, um, then we will, I think, hasten um, the reduction of embodied carbon in concrete um, faster. Um, ultimately, the strategies that we use um, and evaluate through a whole building life cycle assessment will impact our design documents. They have to, right? Um, we have to put what we've um, decided to do onto the documents and, and change the design. Um, this is an example where we really focus on the concrete and um, we specified longer cure times for columns and foundations and high replacement um, in, in the foundations. And this is how it impacted our concrete matrix. Um, we specified a max G GWP acidification and smog for each type of structural element. Um, and this performance criteria, both the structural and environmental performance criteria was then met with an EPD um, from the supplier. Um, in order to evaluate the relative environmental impact of different technologies and cement alternatives um, in various concrete mixtures, it's important to have environmental product declarations. Um, EPDs quantify the environmental impact across multiple categories. And so while different technologies and alternatives can each tout their benefits, um, their proven impact is only verifiable with mixed specific EPDs. Um, and so the demand for product uh, specific EPDs is certainly growing and producers should expect to see this more and more um, in specifications, I think in the coming years. 
So um, we can wrap this up with a couple more resources um, that you can look into if you want to get further into the topic of embodied carbon. Um, the first resource is the AIA Framework for Design Excellence. Uh, the framework is made of 10 measures. It's intended to be accessible and relevant for every architect and every project. And you can see there is a design for resources section that directly addresses embodied carbon best practices. The next one is the 2030 palette by Architecture 2030. The 2030 palette is a free online platform that curates information and practices to provide guiding principles for low carbon buildings. Uh, the sustainable design um, strategies address energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions um, at all scales from regional and city planning to building details. Um, and as part of the palette there, uh, as part of the palette, there's a specific materials palette that was developed. It's an attribute based approach to embodied carbon reductions um, that identifies key attributes that continue to uh, that contribute to a materials um, embodied carbon impact and offers guidelines and options for reductions. Um, it offers all sorts of great information on different materials. Um, here's the concrete page, for example. Another free resource is the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator, or EC3. You can essentially build a whole building in here and see the carbon impact and where you can make reductions. Um, it's a great tool to play around with. Um, you can also use this tool to determine what EPDs are available in your area. Um, I like to see, I like to use this tool to determine um, what um, GWP values I can actually achieve for different types of mixes. Um, so you can go in and you can see what mixes are available in your area and you can pull up different EPDs for different mixes and basically see how you can set a target um, for your for your project. Um, and finally, this tool is called Ecom. Uh, this is the embodied carbon order of magnitude tool and you can input quantities of materials and get their carbon impact. Uh, this was created uh, by SE2050 and is available on their website, but it's just a, a quick and dirty tool to evaluate different options um, without doing a whole building life cycle assessment. Um, and as I mentioned previously in the presentation, the Carbon Leadership Forum um, has a host of resources available to you and then local hubs that you can join. There's a lot of great information on their website and I really encourage you to look at it. Um, so for future resources, um, there's also a new subcommittee of ACI, um, ACI 318N on sustainability. Uh, the plan is for this subcommittee to develop an appendix for the code um, that will provide for materials, methods, and procedures to design concrete structures um, with sustainability in mind. Um, of course, this isn't the first mention of sustainability in the code. Um, 318.14 um, in section 4.9 provided for the first time that sustainability requirements can be used in design um, in addition to strength, serviceability, and durability. Um, and then in 318.19, uh, additional sustainability provisions were introduced. Um, and there are, of course, provisions for the use of alternative cements, uh, recycled aggregates, um, and that are now all outlined um, with limits uh, for concrete production. Um, at Walter P. Moore, we also wanted to contribute to the conversation and we issued an embodied carbon report. And the report has all sorts of great articles and resources that dive into embodied carbon um, and how we're tackling it as a firm. Um, there's one specific on emerging concrete technologies that I wrote that covers a lot of the information I discussed here. Um, but if you'd like to learn more about it and how to tackle it on your projects, you can check that out.